Okay, we're all set. Take it away. All right, welcome. Uh, this is uh, Chromium C++ 201 part three. If this is your first bruise and bites or uh, you haven't seen parts one and two, then basically the point of these talks is just to uh, kind of cover some of the gaps between uh, what you might have picked up as a beginning C++ programmer and uh, what you didn't necessarily learn in, uh, uh, in school, or maybe it's been 20 years and you need a refresher, or maybe you just want to come here and flex your encyclopedic C++ knowledge by asking me questions I can't answer. Um, in, in any case, you're all welcome. So uh, the first two parts um, covered various things involving moves and, you know, actually I don't even remember what's in the first two parts at this point because my brain so um, kind of scattered this morning. So we're just going to go on and say what's in this talk. Uh, in this talk, I will briefly cover passing input arguments. Um, this is actually something that, that could have gone in part one um, after all this stuff about moves and L values and R values and things like that, because it's basically, do you use pass by value or pass by L value ref, or what do you do when you're passing input arguments? Um, and then also another brief section on RAII, which we'll say what that is in case you don't know that acronym. And uh, then some time on data structures and algorithms, uh, specifically the algorithm header. So um, I will manage to cover in 30 minutes what some schools take an entire you know, semester for. No, not actually. Um, it'll be a whirlwind overview of various things. And then like I always do at the end of these talks, um, I'll have some assignments. So uh, I'll say this again, like I really encourage doing at least one or two of these, um, especially if you come to some point in the talk where I say something that you didn't know or um, a thing that you're not as familiar with, then find a, a relevant assignment at the end and, and do that. They're all small tasks that would help clean up the code base um, and give you just a little bit of practice putting uh, into effect some of these recommendations. So real helpful to lock in um, learning stuff. And uh, please feel free to speak up and interrupt me at any given time or type on the chat. I do have the chat up on my screen, so hopefully I will occasionally pay attention to that. Uh, and away we go. So passing input arguments. How the heck do I call a function and pass input arguments to it? Well, um, there's really a couple rules of thumb. And I will say in advance that these are rules of thumb. They're not perfect rules. Um, you can probably find reasons to defy these in almost every case. But the first one, where do you pass by R value ref? Where do you have functions that take um, some type and then amper amper after it? And basically, uh, I only recommend uh, passing these as a rule of thumb for move operators. You can do this in other places, and in, especially if you work with templates, you may have to do this. But ignoring templated code and ignoring sort of more advanced constructs, then basically move operators are going to be the common place where you see this. So the move constructor there at the top and the move assignment operator passed by R value ref. And then there's a couple places where you pass by value. The first place I recommend passing by value is if you have some small cheap struct. And by cheap, I mean as cheap to copy as two pointers. So if you have an int, that's two pointers or less. If you have a pointer, if you have a struct that just has one or two things in it and they're small, um, these are all cases where you probably want to pass by value because the compiler can actually pass things in registers and uh, do a better job than it will uh, if you pass on the stack. Um, you also can pass by value if you have a parameter that's always copied. So if you um, pass something by, say, const ref to a function and then immediately make a copy of it, then you might as well have just passed it by value because you're going to make a copy anyway. So you're making the copy regardless. But when you pass it by value, you can stid move on the caller side for uh, certain cases and get something more cheaply. Now, you might say, that sounds like a really obscure esoteric case. Who would ever do this? Like, why would you have a function where you just immediately make a copy of the thing that you're passing in? The common case of this is actually constructors. 
So if you call a constructor and you immediately um, assign your arguments all into member variables, then in many cases, you want to consider passing them by value and moving them in. Uh, this is not guaranteed to be cheaper in every single case, but as a rule of thumb, this is this is generally the better way to do it rather than pass by const ref and then uh, uh, copy in. And again, this is because uh, at, in the limit, you can get this to be, say, two move constructions of an argument instead of a uh, copy construction. And for things like strings or other large types where you're not where you don't fall into the previous recommendation of pass by value anyway because they're small, um, that those two moves are often cheaper than the one copy. Every other thing that doesn't fall into those, the rule of thumb is pass by const ref. So if you're not sure, you really don't know what to do, you've got something that's maybe kind of big, um, go ahead and pass it by const ref. Um, these all assume, by the way, that you're passing input arguments, of course. If you're passing output arguments, then all of the previous things are off because you need to pass by, say, non-const ref or by pointer or something like that. But um, pass by const ref for large input arguments that you're not immediately making a copy of. OK, and that is the recommendations on passing input arguments. So questions on that? All right, everybody's like, you're amazing. Okay, uh, let's go on to RAII. So um, RAII, basically it stands for resource acquisition is initialization. Now I don't personally find RAII or resource acquisition is initialization very fun to say or very informative, honestly, for that matter. So I am going to uh, instead talk about scoping objects, which is basically what this is. Um, so if you're using a scoping object, um, you're basically bundling up all of the initialization, acquisition, uh, setup, startup, etc., and then also all of the freeing, teardown, cleanup into one single package you're sort of making a resource or a concept be kind of an, ato an atomic thing that you construct and you get it all at once and then you free it all at once. The common cases of this that you might see in our code base, although there are many more than these, uh, are unique pointer and scoped ref pointer. People often think of sort of memory managing types for, um, for RAII scoping objects. And this is because these really help deal with a common problem, which is memory leaks and uh, memory corruption, where you forget to clean up on some code path or it's not clear who who carries ownership of some object. Well, when you have a scoping object, it's hard to forget to clean up. It's easy to pass around ownership along with the resource that it goes with. So this really helps write safer, cleaner code. And you notice this quite a lot when you write functions that have many exit points, because as soon as you start having like return, break, return, continue, blah, 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 and control flow is going several different places, then when you need to do cleanup, you have to either annotate every single one of those call sites and likely forget one in the future, or you need to just go ahead and do um, uh, scoping object. So anytime you find yourself writing cleanup blocks repeatedly on exit points to a function, think about using some kind of a scoping object to do this. And it doesn't have to be scoped pointer or unique pointer. You can use scoping objects that are not just about managing memory. So one example of this in our code base is a type called auto reset. Auto reset is useful as a scoping object to do something like this. Um, hey, I have a block where I want to set some flag to be some value, and then outside that block, I want it to return to its previous value as soon as I exit. Um, maybe I'm doing something like disabling notifications for a time period because I'm in the middle of some processing that I don't want to get interrupted, or uh, some other concept like that. 
auto reset is really useful in these cases because you just instantiate a resetter of whatever type you need and give it the new value. And then um, as soon as it goes out of scope, the destructor puts it back to whatever it was before. You don't have to have a temp that saves off the old value. You don't deal with anything like that. Another related uh, scoping object that isn't quite the same thing as, as doing cleanup on exit, but I do want to mention in this uh, section because it's related to lifetimes, is a base weak pointer. And this is something that uh, you use to monitor another object's lifetime. So if you have <clears throat> a weak pointer to some t here at the bottom, then as soon as t gets freed, the weak pointer becomes null. It doesn't actually clean up t itself, but it monitors t's lifetime and um, lets you do things like, oh, now that this is destroyed, I need to not call functions on it, you know, not do anything, etc. In fact, that kind of pattern is so common that callbacks have built-in support for canceling automatically when they're bound to weak pointers. So if you bind a callback to a weak pointer to something and the thing gets destroyed before the callback runs, you're fine. The callback will just automatically cancel and it won't run on your null object. You won't corrupt memory. Um, and this is why you don't need some kind of annotation like unretained or something when you use a weak pointer. Now, that said, weak pointers uh, are not the be-all, end-all of um, you know, tracking ownership. We don't replace all raw pointers everywhere in the code base with weak pointer. And the reason for this is because the same power that lets you uh, monitor whether the thing is not null anymore also allows you to make it very unclear to people reading your code what the actual ownership and lifetime semantics are. So if you have an A with a weak pointer to B and then a B with a weak pointer to A and I'm reading your code, I have absolutely no idea what's going on. Like, does A own B sometimes, but then maybe it gets destroyed first and you needed to support both? And why on earth do you have a destruction order where like one can go away and even... Usually it's much better to... Um, model your lifetimes as some sort of like tree of ownership where, you know, this thing owns that thing, but not back the other way around. There's no cycles. Um, so use weak pointer where it's appropriate, but don't have weak pointers littered all over your code base. Um, any questions on RAII scoping objects? cleanup, et cetera. Uh, let's see, in the chat, is there also a performance cost associated with weak pointers, especially related to threading? So um, one note for people who do a lot of threading here is that many objects in our code base, including weak pointer, have various cautions about using them across different threads. So with weak pointer, for example, you can pass a weak pointer around to other threads, but you can only check it on the thread that it was created on. Um, assuming I recall that correctly. So you can't really use weak pointers to say um, monitor from one thread an object that's living on another thread uh, that you like created the weak pointer over there and then passed it off. Um, generally in Chromium code, if you're wondering about how to do multi-threaded stuff, you should model it as um, passing callbacks between different things. So, you know, bind a callback to some function on, um, you know, thread A, and then when it runs, have it pass its reply back as a callback to thread B, uh, and then back and forth that way, instead of using something like, um, you know, uh, critical sections that protect variables that you read on both threads or something like that. Uh, let's see, another question in the chat. What are some other strongly recommended use cases for weak pointer? Um, off the top of my head, I don't have anything. Anybody want to speak up with like a, yeah, weak pointers are great for this? Oh, I can think of one actually. Um, well, yes, avoiding use after free in general, but here's a, here's a sample case where you avoid use after free with a weak pointer. Um, anytime you're running a nested message loop, 
So uh, if you're doing something like running a menu, then often in UI code, you'll, you'll spawn the menu, the menu will run, and we have to run a nested message loop um, in certain cases in order to like process the mouse events and things, and then you'll come back. Well, what if during that time, the user went and closed Chrome? Or they did something else that results in the destruction of your object? So one technique you can use for uh, avoiding use after freeze in this case is you can take a weak pointer to yourself before the um, menu starts. And then after the menu comes back, you look at the weak pointer. And if it's null, then you know this has been deleted. So you can't access any more data members on anything. People ask, do you have a question? Uh, no, I was, I was gonna, like, it sort of seems like weak pointer is almost always hot take, like a way to sort of get out when having painted yourself in the corner and you're sort of like not ready to pay that sort of cleanup cost. Like there's not a lot of cases where we have nested run loops where that's actually what we want. They are more of an expedient solution because we haven't cleaned up our sort of uh, message loop lifetimes. And that is always gonna be outside of the scope for like stuff like you just said. So it's basically when you put yourself into into like a context of like, I could be deleted from anywhere. I have no idea what's going on. I'll grab a weak pointer because then I can check later. Um, and ideally you would be notified when you're going away or you'd be going away from like an innumerable set of circumstances rather than like weak pointer gives you the anyone can delete me for any reason whatsoever. And you might not want to support all of those, but you can. Yeah, so I guess I would say in some, this use sparingly comment um, is because weak pointer is not always, but is often a code smell. So um, if you find that you really love weak pointer and you're using it everywhere, you might be doing something wrong. I'm, I'm not prepared to say you definitely are, but whatever. Um, and then finally, and I'm going to go on after this question uh, for time reasons, but uh, Alan asks, not all objects support handing out weak pointers, right? And that's correct. Generally, um, the way you get a weak pointer is you ask a weak pointer factory for it. So your object needs to have like a weak pointer factory. There's also base supports weak pointer. Um, I don't remember exactly off the top of my head how to use some of this stuff. I just always like look it up and copy and paste from code that I know is correct. I'm sorry for cargo culting. Um, so yes, weak pointers, I haven't used them terribly much, but it's good to know about them. So let's go on to data structures. Um, hopefully this is not bringing back horrible memories of college. Um, or if you didn't have a CS degree, then it's definitely probably not bringing back horrible memories of college, but you're saying like, I don't know what you're gonna talk about. The very first thing I'm going to say uh, is I assume that everybody in here knows how to use std vectors. If you don't know how to do that, that's probably more like a C++ 101 class. Um, so it wouldn't be in this talk. But uh, you may not realize that with C++ 11, we got initializer lists for our vectors. So if you end up writing code like the stuff on the top where you're repeatedly pushing something onto a vector, maybe you're doing this in a loop. Like maybe you're, you're you know, pushing you know, this on and then push this on and then push this on. Um, one way that you can avoid doing this, and there are, are other ways to transform those sorts of loops and stuff, I'll get to that in the algorithm section, um, is to use code like is on the bottom here and just write, hey, my vector is one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Uh, this is really good in terms of not only readability, but also performance because this is more efficient the compiler can uh, collapse this down much more significantly. So initializer lists for vectors are yay. Um, use them anywhere you possibly can, pretty much. Other data structures, uh, and we're, this is going to be a little bit of a whirlwind tour, um, and the algorithm section is as well. But I'm just going to briefly go over some things about other data structures that you might want to know. Um, std list is a, a linked list. It's a doubly linked list specifically. And people often know about linked lists um, that the complexity of, of adding to a linked list is, is constant time. If, by the way, if you haven't studied CS and you're like, I don't know what these O's of things mean on this page, um, then just ignore the parts that you don't know what they mean. That's okay. 
hopefully some of the other stuff I'm saying will make sense. Um, but I'm going to assume that the majority of people here probably, you know, know things like, okay, constant time, linear time, blah, blah, blah. So <clears throat> uh, the thing I want to really say about std list is that um, the memory locality of using linked lists is poor. So oftentimes you'll see something where you're like, oh, list insert is O of one and vector insert, you know, is O of N potentially because I've got to move everything back. So list is going to be way cheaper all the time, but this is not necessarily true. And that's because um, list has poor memory locality. Basically every single object on it is, has been allocated in a different spot on the heap. And so you're jumping all over the place in memory, trying to read this thing or write to this thing. Um, whereas in a vector, you have a block of all of your items. And so as soon as you load one item, the data cache line on the CPU has like a lot of the other items in it and reading from them is essentially free. Um, so you need to keep memory locality in mind with a lot of these data structures when you're figuring out like, oh, is my performance gonna be dominated by the actual like algorithmic complexity of this or are other factors gonna play in? And we're gonna see this on our other data types too. STID map and STID set. Uh, these are what's often called associative containers. <clears throat> these are actually, if you learned these originally or you're coming from another language um, and you didn't know this, you might assume that they're built on some kind of a hash table or other hashing data structure. But in fact, std map and std set are built on a tree at the core. So they have logarithmic performance for various things. And trees are, you know, pretty good general purpose data structures for a lot of things. Um, and std map and std set are also pretty good general purpose data structures for a lot of things. If you need to associate items with each other, you know, I have an X, what is the associated Y, then std map is probably never going to be the best absolute choice of data structure but it's probably never going to be the worst choice either. It's, it like has generally average speed and memory performance. Um, a related type to std map is std unordered map, which is in fact built on a hash table. And so naively you would say, aha, you know, now this is my constant time look up and insert. Clearly like we should use unordered map almost everywhere because that's just got better complexity numbers than map on everything. And this is where memory locality comes back and bites us some again, um, as, as well as other factors like the bookkeeping overhead in doing some of the stuff with unordered map. It turns out that for small data sets, and by small, I mean something between say three and a hundred items, um, I'm kind of making up numbers there, but this, the size of sets that we actually typically use a lot in Chromium, like the most common cases for how we use maps, um, then the hash table implementation in unordered map is actually going to be about the same speed as map, but worse on memory usage. So there's really rarely a reason to get this unless you're doing something with far more items, at, in which case the constant time lookups and inserts start to become a dominating factor. So don't just naively assume like, well, I don't care about the order of my map, so clearly I should use the thing that's called unordered map because it's called unordered. Um, this is generally not gonna be a good choice of data structures. And that brings us to the next item, which is base flat map. PBOSS is trying to prefigure me here in the chat. Um, <clears throat> flat map and flat set are actually built on a sorted vector at the core. Now, if, if you're thinking about it kind of at first glance, this sounds like a really bad idea for like a map because as soon as you insert, don't you have to move everything back? And then when you remove, like you have to, you know, move things and you have to keep it sorted. So you have to constantly move stuff around, et cetera. Like, but in fact, again, for small data sets, sorted vectors benefit so much from those memory locality sorts of issues that they end up having better speed and better memory performance than map and especially than unordered map. Um, flat map is kind of the recommended type in Chromium for small usages, which again is, is the 
common case. I don't want to say it's, it's the almost always case, but it's definitely like the majority of what we do. Um, there, this sounds pretty good. Like I'm getting, you know, vector like performance of, um, look up and things from my map like type, but you can in fact do even better than this. And that brings us to one, what I think is one of the most underused things in all of base. So if you haven't heard of this, you're in good company, which is make fixed flat map and make fixed flat set. These are admittedly slightly ugly, but incredibly handy tools that can make compile time maps and sets for you. So if you want to do a lookup table where you map, say, um, I don't know, all the elements in an enum to all the string representations of those values, or um, you know, all of the uh, input flags to the output um, values that those flags should hold, then a make fix flat map or make fix flat set are gonna be your friend. Using them looks like this. Um, like I said, this is, it's a little bit ugly, but all I'm really doing here is saying, hey, I have a map that's that's fixed flat map of, and then you have to give it the types. And then all the foo and bar and baz lines are my initializers there. And then finally the return is the only line that actually runs at runtime. Everything else is compile time in here and is stored in the binary. So you pay zero cost to initialize your map. Um, Let's see, should K names map be static? Um, I don't think it matters in this case. Um, I'm sure immediately some person who knows C++ better than I do is gonna contradict me and say it does matter and yes, it should be static or something. Um, I, don't, I don't think it matters though um, for this because I think when the compiler turns it into a const expert um, at, at compile time, like you just get the same thing. I don't know. Um, take that to CXX on Slack and see what they say. The only downside of make fix flat map is you can't get both your cake and eat it too. You can't have um, a compile time map that you then mutate at runtime to like add another few things to it. Um, once it's compile time static, it's done. Um, so like that's a downside, but a pretty small downside. Um, base circular deck. This is another thing that a lot of people probably haven't seen or used. And I will admit this is a lesser used type, but in case you ever find yourself needing any of the following, a stack, a queue, or a circular buffer, then, or, well, or a deck, but people don't typically need those in most code. Um, then uh, you want to know about base circular deck because this is basically the same thing as std deck, except it has better memory use and better code size. Yay, better memory use and code size are always good things. So um, this is sort of like handy tip, use base circular deck. Um, last couple of items in the data structures section, absolute optional. So you may know this is base optional, um, same thing, and std optional, again, same thing. These are all backports of the C++17 std optional because Chromium is sad and we don't have C++17 yet, um, maybe next year. So uh, optional is, is a, a nullable type for any T. So basically you can use optional int to mean I have an int or maybe I don't. And you can use optional my struct to mean I have this my struct, or maybe I don't. Null opt is the magic signal value that means nothing. If this, the STL had had optional available back in the early days, um, probably a lot of the APIs would have been designed differently. So like all of those std string things that you know you find and then it returns n pause if it doesn't find anything, that might have been done as like an optional size T but we won't know because um, we didn't have optional until C++ 17, so blah. <clears throat> um, let's see, there's some discussion in the chat still on um, uh, make fix flat map. 
And uh, I, so really the core question is like, hey, if I have something that's compile time known, then isn't it compile time known? Um, so the answers in the chat, which is basically the, the, the input may not be known at compile time. So just to give kind of a practical example of this, um, there's code in, uh, there's debug code in Chrome that tries to dump out string or string names of colors for various different colors in the UI. And the way that this works is pretty much you feed an enumerated value to a function that does a lookup on a compile time map and finds the string name for that particular enum value and gives it back to you. And then you can say, oh, my such and such is red. I mean, the compiler just sees this as like my input was FFOOOOO or something like that. Um, and then it has to do the map lookup. So that's an example of a case where the input is not necessarily known at compile time, but the mapping is. Uh, let's see. Oh, hey, more on optional. I probably shouldn't have interrupted myself. Um, so to use optional, it has both pointer semantics and then kind of more class-like semantics. Um, you can just test it and deref it like you would a pointer. Um, but you can also do has value and, and value. These, these two lines at, that I have here mean the same thing. Is there a difference between them? Um, it depends on whether you're in the STL or not and whether you have exceptions on or not. But really, the short answer is no. For all practical purposes in our code base, there's no difference between them. You should use whichever one you find more readable. And I personally find the has value and value versions to usually be more readable. So those are the ones I use. Which one you should use is probably up to you and your reviewer. But if you love me and think all my opinions are great, then you should use has value and value. Um, there's also value or, which is a really convenient construct as long as you don't mind that the, the argument to it is always evaluated. So as long as your value or blah is not a really expensive blah, then you're good. And you can use value or to do like, um, get the value or fall back. Uh, I think final thing in the data structures section is uh, absolute variant. What is a variant? Basically, a variant is a better union. Um, it's also a better, like, if you have optional A, optional B, and optional C, and only one of these is true at any given time, like I have an A or a B or a C, well, use a variant. Because a variant is pretty much exactly that. It's um, exactly one of the types that you feed into it. And it's always guaranteed to hold at least one thing. Um, I say it's better than a union because of various stuff like it's type safe. You can use it with non-basic types, blah, blah, blah. What you should remember simply is like use variant instead of union. Um, Alan says, but can it hold none? And uh, we will get to that in one more slide. Um, so the syntax for this, uh, you can check whether it holds a particular type. You can get some type if you know that it holds that, or you can conditionally get a type, like only if it holds that. Um, basically, the things that you need in order to see what's in the box and get the thing in the box. Um, but the question is, can it hold nothing? And the answer is no. Variants can never hold nothing. And of course, it's obviously going to be useful to hold nothing in some cases. And so they invented this incredibly unmemorable thing called absolute monostate. I'm sure that a monostate is like some English word that means exactly what this thing is. And thus, it's totally the appropriate name. But I don't know what the heck a monostate is. So I have to look this up on Stack Overflow every time I need to use it. Um, don't feel bad if you need to do something similar. Uh, absolute monostate is basically just a constructible void type. So this is your it holds null. Um, if you want your variant to be able to ha have nothing in it, then you put a monostate in it. And that's your nothing. We. Um, oh, I lied. It wasn't the last thing. This is the last thing. Um, I swear. Pinky swear. Um, base string piece and string piece 16. Um, these are not about by the way, uh, converting between um, various different string encodings like UTF-8 and UTF-16 or something. 
Um, that's going to be in C++ 201 part four. But uh, these, these are what's called view types. And they're pretty much just a character pointer and a size. So they say somebody else owns some character data somewhere. Maybe it's a string. Maybe it's a data block in the binary. Um, I have a window into that thing that I can maybe slide around by adjusting the pointer and the, the size. And now I can pass that around. So this is cool because copying string pieces is just copying a pointer and a size, which is as fast as moving a std string. And you can use these most of the same places that you would use like a string ref. But in a lot of cases, it's better because you don't necessarily have to have ever constructed a string from it. So um, an example of this is with constants. If you have some constant in quotes in, at compile time, it's stuffed in a data block in the binary. Well, you can take a string view to that and you just have a pointer to something in your binary. You never constructed a std string from it to begin with. Yay. Um, you also can avoid um, creating a bunch of temps and copying a bunch of character data around when you're doing substring manipulation, if you're doing a lot of substring manipulation, because Again, you're just sliding your window into this one string that exists. Um, and this guarantees move-like efficiency of string arguments without the quadratic overload of like defining various different sets of arguments as um, std move, or I mean, as uh, R value ref or not. But as PBOSS alludes to in the comments, um, these are super scary to store. You should think of string view or string piece Sorry, I said string view because that's the standard name. Um, you should think of string piece as good for arguments, good for temps, bad for members. Um, the same sort of way that you would think of like uh, a reference. Um, good to pass things by reference, often good to have reference temps, usually not what you want to have members that are references um, because that means that somebody else is guaranteeing the lifetime of this object and unless you can enforce that somehow, um, you're leaving yourself open to some kind of memory hole. OK, that was a ton of stuff on data structures. Um, so questions about that. So let's see. Also bad to use in CTORs per previous discussion, question mark. Um, actually, passing string pieces in constructors is, is basically fine because um, passing these, these are small things. So they fall into the like pass by value um, and they have, they, they are kind of like getting move construction of, uh, of SID strings for free. So if you want to have your constructors take string piece arguments, um, often that's a good thing. Now, if you are like taking a string on your caller side, passing it through a string piece and then putting it back into a string, then it might've been more convenient in the end to do two moves, but um, the benefits of being able to pass in non-strings are in some cases worth it. Other questions on data structures before we jump to our final section. Everybody's like, Mr. Johnson, may I be excused? My brain is full. Um, well, I have bad news for you. Um, the, the next part is going to be even more like just rapid fire throw stuff at you. But there is one big takeaway that I want to take away from this algorithm section. And, and that really is um, you should use algorithms. And I'm going to try to make the case for why. And when I did my test round of this, my test audience was like, why did you spend so much time on this slide? I mean, isn't it kind of obvious that algorithms are better? You, you sort of made your point. And I said, well, historically, there's been a lot of resistance to using algorithms. And a lot of the resistance has been um, people who say, hey, I find this you know, really unmemorable. To, so I, I have to look them up to write them. I have to look them up to know how to read them. Um, it's, it, for that reason, like, it seems kind of cryptic and, and difficult. And I, I really just don't prefer not to use these. I think that's a fair argument. Um, here's why I think that algorithms are awesome and you should use them. The, the single biggest reason is this first bullet point, and that is that they're higher level constructs. And a lot of the other stuff is going to flow from this. 
So this tells the reader what you're trying to do and not just the mechanical steps of how you're trying to do it. It's the same thing as black box encapsulating other pieces of functionality in your, um, uh, in your code into small functions and then calling those functions from various places uh, or stuff like that. When you write um, copy if blah, 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 I know immediately that you're doing some kind of a copy and it's predicated on something. In a lot of cases, that's all I need to know. I don't even need to know what you're copying or exactly why or something because I'm just scanning through my through your code, like sort of grasping the high level flow of things until I get to the place that I need to understand very deeply. So being able to see that is great. Unfortunately, uh, in a lot of cases, what I have instead is a big for loop that does a bunch of stuff inside the loop. Now, each individual line of that is very easy to read. I can read for loops really fast, but I have many more statements to go through to figure out like, okay, so you're like looking at this thing and you're testing it and you're, you're oh, okay, this is just copying stuff if blah, 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 and then I go on. And some people say, okay, well, you know, I'll just put block comments above each little block that say like copy the such and such if whatever. Great, awesome, do that, but, um, you know, even better to have code that's automatically descriptive of what it's trying to do. Uh, and that's going to come back to us in the last bullet here. But before that, I, I will also say a few other benefits of algorithms. They're succinct. Um, if you write an algorithm call, you can often like perform much more work in a much smaller area. And again, if I'm scanning over your code and I don't need to care about this particular line, then succinct is great. If I do need to care, it's, you know, potentially a minus. But the times when I don't need to care about every line I'm reading far outweigh the times when I do need to care about it. Um, they're well tested. Somebody else has gone through the work of making sure that this works and doesn't have missing edge cases. They're optimized already for you. And, and then finally, when I say they're maintainable, um, this comes back to the higher level bit again. If you write copy blah, 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 and you're using STID algorithm, then we can come through and we can exchange that using you know some clang pass or something for a more optimized more efficient more improved version of that call sometime later because we we know exactly what you're trying to do what we can't do is come through and replace your big for loop that does that same thing with a single call automatically because it's very hard to tell if it had side effects or if it was doing some other thing so like basically large scale changes are harder to do on code that doesn't use algorithms than they are on code that does. So that's that's some of my claims on why these are a good thing. Um, now, algorithms have had kind of a bad reputation as being you know, really cumbersome to the point of why would I even bother to use this? And especially back in C++03, it often looked like this. Um, if you never had to do this, then be glad because functors really sucked. They were basically these classes where you uh, overloaded operator paren paren and then you constructed the class and passed it to the algorithm. It's terrible. Um, you don't want to do this. So C++11 came along and it gifted us with lambdas and lambdas made everything vastly better because now you could just pass a lambda to your predicate taking algorithm um, and suddenly like the world was nice. But in fact, the uh, benefits do not stop there because base ranges algorithm.h exists. And I'm going to claim that any time in the future that you ever find yourself wanting to use something from the algorithm bracket bracket header, you should use this header instead. Because this is basically a backport of the C20 ranges constrained algorithms. So it replicates like pretty much all the functionality of algorithm, but it gives you various benefits. One of the benefits is that you don't have to pass iterators anymore, um, at least if you don't want to. You can, but uh, if you just want to say the whole container, then notice how here I say find if, and I just pass T's, my whole container of T's. I don't say T's.begin, comma, T's.end. And this is nice, not only because, hey, begin and end are kind of crufty, but because it also means I don't have to create some temp T's just to store the results of some temporary calculation just so I can call begin and end on it. I can just do my calculation right in line there. So that's nice, but even nicer 
are that we can do like fancy manipulations of stuff in the algorithms using projections and pointers to members. So projections are kind of an optional final argument to your uh, range algorithms that let you take each input element to the algorithm and transform it uh, or project it through some kind of operation before you do everything else on it. So this first example that I have here, it looks a little cryptic initially. It says find T's three T field. What, what is this? Um, this means go through T's and find the first thing whose field member variable is equal to three. So I'm projecting each T by, by getting the field member off of that. And then I'm using the field member as my, like, what do I find? I find three in the field members. Um, you can use this with member functions, member variables, non-member functions. You can do a lot of really powerful stuff with this. Um, and similarly, this copy if uh, is, is doing like basically copy, copy from T's, and then if you look at the back argument, it says V from T, I'm converting my T types to V types. And then my predicate is, is V valid? Uh, and then I back insert them. So what this says is, hey, go through all my T's, convert them to V's and copy all the valid ones onto my V's vector. Now, if you're not familiar with reading algorithm calls, that's not necessarily tremendously obvious and readable right at a glance you may have to look up like what the order of arguments is. But if you are familiar with reading them, you know, or if you spend a little bit of time puzzling it out, I claim that, it, that this is actually better than writing a big loop that does all of those things. Uh, whether you wanna believe me is up to you. So a whirlwind tour of some of the great things in base ranges algorithms. These are also in, in the uh, STID algorithms uh, that you should use. And I, I don't want you to try to like memorize everything on this. I just want to kind of scatter shot like, hey, there's this and there's a this and this other thing. And if you see one that kind of strikes your fancy and you say, that sounds interesting. I, I like doing that kind of thing. Then uh, maybe jot the name down while we go past. So Find, find if, and equal range. This is how you go through a container and you locate items that match. Um, give me the, the item or the set of items that match my predicate. Count and count if. This is how you count how many matching items you have. So I've seen lots of code in Chromium that does like go through my container and increment a little counter every time that I like, you know, see something that matches and then what's my counter at the end? Well, you could have just done a call to count if and your counter could be const. Any of, all of, and none of. How many times have you seen a little function written just so that it can like loop through a container and as soon as it sees something matching a conditional or not, it like returns false or returns true. I have seen this code a lot of times. Every one of those cases could be replaced by a call to these algorithms. Um, copy if. Uh, I've already showed this one in, in practice a little bit, but uh, basically just like copy some matching items from one container to another thing. Base erase and erase if. Now, if you do know your algorithms library, you might know that there is something called remove if. You should not use remove if. Remove if is a foot gun because remove if does not remove anything from your container. Remove if actually means hey, uh, move all of the other non-matching things to the front of my container and leave garbage at the end of the container, which may include like the items that I supposedly removed. Uh, and then you have to actually shorten your container to get rid of those things. Well, this is horribly inconvenient and basically never what you actually want. You always want to actually remove everything. And so in C++20, there is an erase and erase if that does this. It does what you wanted it to do. And base erase if is a backport of it. So erase matching items from a container. Yay. Sort and stable sort. It, uh, it sorts. I don't know what else to say about it. Um, a stable sort is a sort that preserves the relative order of things that are equal. So if you've ever done one of those like 
click on one column of a table header and then click on another column so that you have kind of like a, a sort and then a fallback sort inside it or something. That's that's a stable sort. So if you're implementing table headers, stable sort. Um, for other places in the code, probably you just want sort. Partition. This is kind of like sort, except it's just a one bit true or false. Like everything that matches true goes on the front and everything that is false goes on the back. Um, I partition is, I think one of my favorite cleanups I did once where I replaced like 11 statements with a single call to partition. Um, it was rad. I don't know. I get a charge out of like cleaning up and shortening code. That's probably just me. Rotate, um, one of the most underused and misunderstood algorithms. So rotate just shifts blocks of items around. Anytime that you want to take an item and put it on the front or put it on the back of your list, or maybe you want to take like a whole set of items and move them to the front or the back, um, you want rotate. Maybe they should have called it shift, but shift kind of has other meanings. So um, maybe they shouldn't call it shift. Um, there's also stable partition, someone notes in the chat. Yes, and, and I should note, this is by no means exhaustive. There are many other things in the algorithms library. I chose a small subset of them that, that represent the ones that I personally use the most and found to be the most relevant to Chrome, but um, there are tons of other things, some of which you might find amazing. I, I do recommend like just glancing through the algorithm like header definition thing on, on cppreference.com at some point. Uh, transform, this is my personal favorite. Um, transform lets you project, translate, uh, or even combine all items. I learned something new while writing this talk. I didn't know you could do the binary op version of transform, but there it is, the, second, the, the last bullet down there at the bottom. I can transform two different, um, input lists together by say adding them and put the sums somewhere um that was kind of neat i'm not sure where i would use that but it's neat uh but transform is basically just like that projection thing except a whole algorithm call based around it in case that's all you wanted to do and of course before ranges you didn't have built-in projections in in your algorithm calls so you probably needed that um, quite a lot Min element, max element, min max element. I have seen a lot of code go through and you know loop through various different containers and say, hey, what's the biggest thing in this container? What's the smallest thing? Well, here you go. Here's an algorithm that does that for you. Um, in fact, you can get both min and max at the same time and less expensively than if you did them separately. So yay. Um, getting to the last couple here. In fact, I think this is the last one. Um, base clamp. This isn't quite like some of the other algorithms, but it goes better in this section than anywhere else. Um, clamp pretty much enforces range limits on an item. So if you ever find yourself writing code like min of max of min and max and like you're trying to remember which min goes with which max and like make sure you don't swap the order of arguments around and then end up like having a range that's crossed up like this. Like avoid all of those problems, use base clamp and you get, you know, clamp T between min and max done. Um, Yes, Samuel notes that the argument order is not like min comma t comma max, which would be more of like the mathematical, like one less than or equal to t less than or equal to five or something. Um, I agree that that's kind of sad, but clamp t between min and max is, is kind of nifty. Uh, so um, that brings us to the end of algorithms. Any questions on that before I give you your assignments? People are like, no, stop, go on, finish, get me out of here. Um, so there's lots and lots of assignments this time because we covered a lot of stuff. Um, so uh, I'm not going to read through all of these, but basically we have some stuff up at the top related to passing arguments. 
Um, we have stuff related to scoping objects. Um, we have like makes fix flat map and, and variant for, for data structure stuff. And then we have algorithm calls um, at, at the bottom. So if in any of these sections in this talk, you found something that was new to you, um, please pull out the appropriate bullet and, and send me CLs. I have in fact had people send me CLs for both parts one and two. So I know that the, you know, like two or three of you out there who have done that um, are in fact paying attention during this part and the rest of you all get demerits and have to take detention after class. Um, no, you don't. Um, in, in fact, if you find none of these useful, then don't do any of them. But that is my last slide. Um, final questions, comments, anything. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks very much, everybody. Yeah, base ranges is base ranges is the stuff. Um, so definitely use base ranges. Um, so there's going to be one more part in this um, C plus plus two hundred one part four. I haven't written it yet. I do have an outline for it, um, and it it will be. Marab, do you have the schedule? Do you know when that yeah, is? Yeah, it will be on August thirty first. Okay, so the end of this month. So. Uh, See us all back here for that if you're available, and uh, that'll end the series. So thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for joining us, everyone.